come to glorify you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, yanamase. Spirit. 
you sing it with me? Just the voices. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, your glory, God is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Let me know the kisses of your mouth, feel your embrace. Let me smell the fragrance. Of your touch, see your lovely face. Oh, take me away. Even so, Lord, come. Let me know the kisses of your. Let me smell the fragrance of your touch, see your lovely face, so take me away, even so.
Can you say this? I trust you, Lord. Because I trust you, Lord. Yes, I do. I trust you with my life. Oh, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. We trust you, Lord. I trust you with my
blessing. Amen. I love being in the presence of the Lord and worship always. It brings the Lord's presence. It brings us into his presence. And the Bible says that in his presence, there's fullness of joy and pleasures evermore. Amen. I'm so blessed. Amen. That you're here tonight with me at West Coast Believer Center. We're so honored. Amen. To have you with us. Amen. Because I believe that God has a word for every one of us. Amen. Regardless of where you may be, you may be watching from the United States of America or you might be like the many people around the world that are a part, amen, of this program tonight. And I'm just so blessed that God chose you, amen, to be here to receive his word because his word, it's life. It's life to our hearts, amen. And I'm so glad that God's going to take your life to a whole nother level, amen. Welcome today to West Coast Believer Center. I'm Pastor Joshua Bolger and I have the privilege of being the senior pastor over this house. And again, we're so honored to have you as our guest today. I guarantee you, amen, your footsteps were ordered here because God is going to release a rhema word that is gonna propel you, amen, into the destiny that God has for you and you are going to lack nothing, amen. If you will take the word of God, allow it to go from your head into your heart, amen, to where you go from knowing it to believing it, you're going to receive the manifestation of those words. Amen. We'll be getting to the message in just a moment. But at this time, we're going to continue to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Amen. 
On your screen, there's going to be a list of information on different ways that you can participate in returning the Holy Tithe as well as presenting your offerings tonight. Amen. You can give through text to give and some of the other features that we have. Very safe, very secure way. But as you're preparing your offering, I want you to take a moment to pray. And I want you to listen to the words that the Lord's put on my spirit. Amen. To be able to share with you concerning the offering and the tithes tonight. It's found over, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> it's, it's found over here. Uh, oh, you know what, man? I done lost my place. But let me just say this. Thank you, Jesus. It's found over in Mark chapter 14. And it's uh, Jesus is preparing for, you know, uh, what was coming, his destiny, amen? Here he is, you know, uh, right before he was betrayed, amen? This was the thing that caused Judas to be pushed over the edge. And I find it interesting that it had to do with an offering that somebody else had given that changed his heart to put him into a place to where he was seeking an opportunity to betray the Lord. Amen, listen to this powerful truth right here. In Mark chapter 14, verse 1, it says, After two days was the feast of the Passover and unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. Talking about Jesus. And it says, But they said not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment. It says of spikenard. Very precious. Write that down if you're taking notes. What she brought to Jesus was very precious. And she break the box and she poured it out on his head. So she has this, this amazing um, ointment, amen, this beautiful, sweet-smelling perfume, amen. Some scholars say that the price of it was a year's worth of wages and that that uh, was also, amen, her dowry for when she was to be married. It was what was to be given to her husband. Look at this. And it says that she took the box, she broke it open, and she poured it out on the head of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it says, and there were some, check this out, there were people that were in the room. This wasn't him on the mountainside with crowds of people, the masses. No, this was him with his inner circle. This was him with people that were close to him even people that were involved in the ministry. <clears throat> and the Bible says that there were some that had indignation within themselves, and they said, check this out, they said this in their hearts, why was this waste of the ointment made? Why was this waste made? And it says, for it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. Isn't this something? Let me tell you something, non-givers will always be critical of those that give. I always find it interesting that people that don't have a heart to give always have an opinion about giving, even though they're the ones not doing anything. They'll tell you how important something else is to give to, but if you were to press them, you would find out they don't give to the poor either, you know? But they found this intimidating, why? Because here you have this strange woman, she's not even traveling with Jesus, but she shows up and she gives an offering. She presents a gift that is so precious to where it's more than those that were with him had ever given. And it was very precious, not just in its cost or its value. It was precious to this woman. It was her greatest seed. It was like the widow's might. This woman gave everything she had. She gave her future. It was her dowry. Now listen, <clears throat> It says right here that, and Jesus, verse six said, leave her alone. Why trouble you her? She has wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always. And whensoever you may, you should do them good. But me, you have not always. Notice this. Jesus made a distinction between the poor and himself because Jesus wasn't poor. That's for sure. But he brings out this truth. He said, quit complaining about her offering. How many know it's not what somebody else gives that's going to change your life. It's what you choose to give. And tonight we have an opportunity, amen, to choose what we're going to offer to the Lord as our worship, amen? The tithe has already been determined. That's the Lord's. That's us just giving back to God what is his so that we're not stealing it from him, amen? But the offering, the offering is determined by our heart, amen, and what the Lord prompts our heart to do. Jesus tells them, this woman recognizes, she has a revelation, she realizes 
who she's giving to. And she understands that she can give to the poor any time that she wants because the poor will always be with you. That's what the Bible says. But she understood, I will never always have an opportunity to be able to be with Jesus, to be able to give to the one, amen, that I believe is the Messiah. And you see right here that it says that he said she done what she could. He says, she has come aforehand to anoint my body for the burying. Verily I say unto you that wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also what she has done, check this out, her offering, he says, it shall be spoken of her for a memorial. Can you imagine this? This woman's gift was meant so much to her. I mean, it was very precious that it meant so much to Jesus. It meant so much to God. And I'm telling you, God watches how we give. He's not looking at the amount. He's looking at the heart behind the gift, behind the offering, because an offering is simply an offer. It's us saying, God, I offer you this. It's us showing our value, amen, of who he is. And it's us showing our value for what he has done to us, how much he means to us. And right here, he was telling us that this woman's offering moved him so much. He said, it will be a memorial. He said, wherever the gospel is preached, check this out. Wherever people hear about Jesus, they're going to hear about this one woman's sacrificial gift. And it goes on to say right here, and Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went unto the chief priest to betray him, to betray Jesus. And when they heard it, they were glad and they promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Notice this, his heart, amen, was, was, was angry at the woman for what she gave, but his heart was not moved, amen, to receive money to betray Jesus. Isn't that something else? Most people won't complain when someone gives to them, but you really know the heart of somebody, amen, when it comes to an opportunity for them to give to somebody else. But I want to focus on this. The woman's offering was precious. It had weight. It had value. And I'm telling you, every time we have an opportunity like we do right now to be able to give to the Lord, you want to give something that's precious. Notice the woman, amen, she broke the box. What I find interesting is that once you break something open like that, there's no way of putting it back in. Amen. And when we bring our tithes and our offerings tonight, amen, present something to the Lord and break it. Amen. Put it into a, into a position to where there's no way for you to hold back anything. Amen. That you're pouring out on Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the call of Jesus, the purpose of Jesus. Amen. This beautiful gospel. Amen. I know that some people will see giving as a waste. And this is what I find interesting with this story is that the reason why they considered it a waste wasn't because of what she gave, but it was because of who she gave it to. She gave it to Jesus. Amen. She gave it to the ministry. And some people will see that as a waste. But this woman, she's seen it as great gain. God had must, must have revealed something to her heart to where she understood this oil is needed because he's about to die. And it was used to prepare his body for the burial. He smelt so amazing while they were whipping him, while they were beating him, when they were nailing him to the cross, the garment that they took off of him, that they gambled for. Listen to me. It was drenched, amen, with the fragrance of this offering that the woman had given to him before. Amen. That's what we want. The Bible says that our prayers, amen, and our, our giving, it's like a sweet smelling fragrance to God. So tonight as you worship the Lord with your giving and as you return the holy tithe, Amen. Break it and spill it out. Pour it out on Jesus and watch and see what God will do for you. It'll rise up as a memorial. If it is precious to you, my brothers, my sisters, it will be precious to God and you'll see the Lord multiply it. And that offering will always be remembered. Amen. When your name is mentioned because your offerings help to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Your offerings help to, to promote. Amen. The vision that God's given to West Coast Believers Center. Amen. And I just want to say thank you so much for, for your obedience. Thank you so much for honoring God tonight with your giving. Let me say a prayer over you. Heavenly Father, I just pray a special blessing over, Lord, the tithes and the offerings tonight. Lord, we're so honored, Lord, to be able to give to you the one that has held back nothing, Lord, that you've given to us. And I just pray, Lord, increase your people. Multiply their seeds sown. 
And Lord, cause it to come back to them, Lord, in the form of an extravagant harvest, Lord. Manifest, mighty God, what it is that they are believing for, what they are sowing for. And Lord, may our gifts tonight, Lord, be a memorial, mighty God. Lord, something that is established by you, something that testifies, mighty God. Lord, to future generations, Lord, the beauty, Lord, of what we have given to you in your name. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Again, I pray blessings over the tither, blessings over the giver, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap, amen. He's worthy of it, amen. Praise God. Man, I'm super excited about this message that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight, amen. I've been doing a series on the spoken word of God, amen, the power and the authority that's in the word when you speak what God says. And tonight, I want to continue with this. If you haven't heard the first two parts of this message, I encourage you, go back, amen, and listen to the, those messages because each one is building, amen, upon the other. And this, my friends, is a master key. When my wife, Eliana, and I received, amen, this revelation of the power of the words that we speak, I'm telling you, it changed everything about our marriage. It changed everything about our ministry. It changed everything about our finances. We have not been the same ever since we understood the power, amen, of the words that we speak. You know, Jesus, amen, he is the living word, according to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God, amen. Everything you've seen that has been made was made by the word, amen. And God uses his word, amen, not only to build everything that you see out here in this world and in this universe, amen, but he uses that same word to build your world, amen, the life that you live in, amen. And I'm telling you, as you get revelation of this, you're going to see your world change, amen. Instead of you hoping and wishing and praying for something to happen, you're going to realize that you have authority and you have the power of speaking like God spoke. When God said, light be, light was, amen. And when you use the power of that same uh, power that God had, remember, God breathed into Adam, amen, and Adam became a speaking spirit. He breathed into him, the Bible says, the breath of life. That's why everything that you say matters, amen? And your life today is the result of the seeds that you've sown yesterday, amen? And also the words that have come out of your mouth, good and bad, amen? And we're going to talk more about that right now. I want to begin by going to our foundational scriptures. I want you to turn with me over to Mark chapter 11, and uh, I, I want to pick it up right over here where Jesus, amen, um, is talking to his disciples. There's a situation that had transpired to where uh, he had been ministering uh, in a nearby community, and as they were walking by, the Bible says that he seen a fig tree afar off, and it had leaves on it, and Jesus, the Bible says he was hungry. So Jesus goes over this tree expecting to find figs, but when he arrived, the Bible says there were no figs because it wasn't the season for figs. Now, this is the challenge, you know, is that when a fig tree produces leaves, the, the fruit, the fig, grows at the same time as the leaves. So something happened that caused that tree to start to produce leaves, but it did not want to produce the fruit. Jesus, he understood that it was his faith that put a demand on that tree. The creator put a demand on the creation and the creation held back what belonged to him. And because of that, the Bible says that Jesus spoke to the tree. It says that he answered the tree. Now, how many know you don't answer something unless it's speaking to you? You don't answer someone unless they're saying something to you. But the Bible says he answered the tree and he said, no one will ever eat fruit from you ever again. Next day, they're walking that same path and they're passing that tree and his disciples seen the fig tree. They seen that it was withered up from the roots. And the Bible says, Peter called the remembrance, you know, what had happened. He said, look, master, the tree that you cursed, he said, it's died. And Jesus begins to share something very, very powerful with them. This again is a huge master key for us as Christians. Amen. When it comes to understanding the power of the spoken word. So right here in Mark chapter 11, Beginning in verse uh, 22, it says, And Jesus answering saith unto him, them, Have faith in God. Or literally the proper translation in the Greek would be, uh, Have the faith of God, 
Or we would say simply in our common vernacular, we would say, have the God kind of faith, the kind of faith to where when you speak, amen, things happen. What you say, it happens. You know, the same way God said light be, amen, and light was, he said, you have the same power, amen. So he says, if you have that kind of faith to where what you say you believe, it will produce the results that you desire. What you say, you will have it. So he goes on right here and he says, have the faith in God or have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever, that means this works for anybody, any human being, that whosoever shall say, underline that in your Bible, notice your mouth has to be involved, amen, because faith is voice activated. Write that down. Faith is voice activated. The Bible says, I have believed, therefore I have spoken. So your mouth is involved in the process, amen. He says, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. So notice you, 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 you can't have doubt. You can't be saying the right things, but you don't believe it. Because you won't receive what you criticize. And if you say the right things, God can heal me. But in your heart, you're like, I don't believe it. You'll never get healed. You know? So he says right here, he says, but shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. Check this out. But shall believe that those things which he saith, underline that in your Bible, he says, he, it, they shall come to pass. He shall have, look at this, whatsoever he saith, underline that in your Bible. Notice your mouth is involved as well as your heart because faith has to be in two locations. It has to be in your mouth and it has to be in your heart. You have to believe it, amen, and hear, amen, so that when you speak it, Amen. It's being released with, with faith. It's faith-filled words. Amen. Because see, when something's in your head, you know it. But once it goes from your head into your spirit, once it becomes rhema, life, real, alive to you, amen, then, oh, I'm telling you, then that word, amen, it's not something you just know. It's something that you own. It's like nobody can ever change your mind because that word has been made real. It's been made rhema to you. So he says the person that has that understanding he says, they will have whatsoever they say. And the reason why he was using this mountain as an illustration and the power of speaking words, because what he was trying to teach us was simply this. God spoke the word, and that's what put the mountain where the mountain is. Amen. In the same way God spoke the word to move the mountain there, when you speak the word, you can move the mountain to other places. Amen. And I've learned this in life, that if you do not speak to your mountains, your mountains will definitely be speaking to you. Mountains of lack, mountains of anxiety, mountains of depression, mountains of pressure. What mountains are you facing today, my brothers and sisters? What mountains are you having stand in front of you? What, what, what mountains are mocking you today? I'm here to tell you, speak the word. Believe what God says. Amen. Remove that mountain from off the path that God has chosen for your life. Amen. You don't have to go over that mountain. I'm telling you, you can go through it. Amen. Because God has given you this creative force. Amen. The power of the spoken word. Again, this is a master key, a huge master key when it comes to us receiving all that God has to say. Amen. You have what you say. Amen. When you believe it. Amen. When you believe it. Now, Hold your place there and go with me real quick over to Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23, verse 7. Amen. You guys following along here? Is this all right? Proverbs 23, verse 7 says this, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Check this out. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. Remember, where do you, have, where do you know it at? You know it in your head, but you own it in your heart. Again, he says, for as he thinks in his heart, how you believe in here, he says, you will have it. Amen. As he thinks in his heart, that's what he's going to be. If you think that you're a champion, let me tell you something. If you believe that in your heart, you're going to be a champion in life. If you believe, amen, in, in your heart that you're born again, let me tell you something. I mean, you know that heaven is your home. Amen. You become, amen, what you believe. Amen. So what you believe is where you will end up. If you believe that God's called you to prosper, let me tell you something. Your days of lack and want are going to be behind you, amen, when you believe that. Amen. If you believe, amen, maybe you're, you've been attacked with sickness or a disease or maybe you've received a bad report from the doctors. Let me tell you something. What you believe, you will receive, amen. And so it's so important, amen, for us 
to watch over this heart and to watch over this mouth because this is where life begins to be created, amen, within us. This right here is what helps us not only to wait on God to make things happen, we're tapping into a power and an ability that he's given to every one of us as human beings, not just as believers, because this works for sinners too. There's a reason why witch doctors and warlocks speak curses over people, places, and things. It's because they have a revelation within themselves, an evil revelation that what you say, it makes a difference. I remember the first time I ministered in London years ago. I remember I was driving down the street with the pastor and I noticed at certain intersections, there was a VCR tape and cassette tape, the, the tape inside of the devices. I, you'd see lots of it wrapped around uh, light posts and around stop signs, things of that nature. And I remember I, I finally asked, I said, what, what's the story with the, the videotape and, you know, the cassette tape, you know, that I see wrapped around these poles and trees? And he said, oh, that's witches and warlocks will record themselves, uh, you know, with video or audio speaking curses concerning this location, this intersection, this area where they'll speak curses and then they'll come down here and they'll wrap those things up. You know, they'll say like people are going to die in this intersection. You know, uh, they'll speak negative things of that nature. They'll speak death and they believe it so much. They go down there as an act of their faith and they wrap those tapes, those curses around those, those things. And so if the devil, amen, understands this and his followers do, you and I as Christians better understand this principle as well. Amen. He says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So notice things start right here in the heart. Amen. Now go back over here to Mark chapter 11 one more time. And I want you to look at verse 23 with me. He says, for verily I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, this is written in red. He says that whatsoever you shall say unto, the, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Now I'm gonna tell you, this is one of the problems that I have found with so many believers is that too many people say what they have, not say what they're believing for. Let me say that again. Too many people will say what they have Man, we're broke. We're dead broke. Or they'll be like, man, my arthritis is killing me. Or they'll, they'll, they'll speak death, words of death. Amen. They'll, they have more faith in the dysfunction than they have in the promises of God. Amen. So it's important, amen, that you guard your mouth. Amen. We'll be talking about that here, maybe today, maybe in the next episode. But I'm here to tell you, it's so important, amen, that you say what God says. Amen. Amen. That, that it's not us being ignorant. It's not us, you know, living in a fantasy land. It's us understanding that God's word is truth. Everything else is facts. It might be a fact that right now you have no money. It might be a fact right now that you have a disease that is incurable, like cancer. It might be a fact that you have real pain in your body. It might be a fact that right now you're living in your car. Or it might be a fact that you don't have the money to pay your rent. Whatever the facts may be, let me tell you something. God's word is truth. Amen. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them. That means separate them. Set us apart by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Facts are a lower form of authority. Truth is a higher form. Amen. Truth is the highest form of reality. And when you put facts in the face of truth, facts have to bow to truth. I'm telling you, facts can change but the truth will always be the truth. That's why it's so important, amen, that you say what God says. And if you can't say what God says, then keep your mouth shut until you can. Someone say amen. It's so important, amen, that you put a guard on your mouth, amen. Now look over here at Romans chapter four, verse 17 with me. Romans chapter four, verse 17. Amen, he says that you can have whatsoever you say. So we need to make sure we're saying positive things, amen? We're speaking the word of the Lord. Romans 4, 17 says this, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, it says, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. 
He calls those things that be not as though they were. He doesn't say you call the things that are as though they're not. And this is where I've seen some people make mistakes, you know, where they call things that are as though they're not. It's like you have somebody that uh, they have a half of a revelation of what I'm teaching to you. It's where they understand you have to watch what you say, but they think that they have to speak what, they, what is as though it's not. That's not what the Bible says. So I've met people that have a broken arm and I'll see their arm in a cast and I'll be like, hey, what's the matter with your arm? Nothing's wrong with my arm. And I'm like, ah, there's something wrong with your arm. You, you're, you have a cast on your arm. You know, nothing's wrong with my arm. And, you know, um, and my, my arm, you know, my, there's nothing wrong with it, you know. And the fact of the matter is, is their arm's broken. You know what I'm saying? He's not saying don't call your broken arm unbroken. What he's saying is you call those things that are not as though they are. I'm the healed of the Lord. Amen. I am restored. Amen. God renews me. Amen. He quickeneth my bones and strengthens my body. Amen. That if the sp same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, you know, dwells inside of me, he's quickening my mortal body. And by his stripes, I am healed. Amen. That's the truth. Amen. That's speaking the truth. Amen. Again, Romans 4, 17, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. I'm the healed of the Lord. We're not calling the things that are as though they're not. We're not denying, oh man, the arm's broken, but what we're confessing, amen, and what we're declaring is that we have healing in Jesus, amen, and that will trump whatever facts are trying to say, amen. I hope you, I hope you receive that and understand what I'm sharing with you, amen. Now, um, look over here at Joel chapter 3, verse 10, Joel chapter 3, verse 10. When it comes to the power of what you speak, you know, for the sake of time, I'm just going to give this to you. Write this down, Joel chapter 3, verse 10. And write down 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Joel chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. And in Joel chapter 3, verse 10, this is what it says. Let the weak say, I am strong. Amen? And then over in uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it talks about how Jesus, who being rich, amen, became poor for our sake so that we may become rich. Amen? Amen? There's a song that, you know, we used to sing in the church, amen, some churches still do, to where, you know, it says, give thanks with a grateful heart, you know, it says, let the weak say that I am strong, let the poor say that I am rich, why? Because of what the Lord has done, amen, this is exactly what I'm talking about, amen, you have what you say and what you believe, good and bad, so it's so important, amen, that we declare those right things, that we speak truth, amen, that we speak the truth in love, and that we speak the truth again, and I'm being redundant for a reason, we speak the truth with all of our heart believing the words, amen, that are coming out of our mouth. Why? Because when you say what God says, you'll have what God says you can have. Praise the Lord, amen. This revelation changed our lives. We learned how to become skillful with the words that were coming out of our mouths. And if, you know, my wife and I, as we were learning this revelation, you know, and the power of this revelation, you know, we both helped each other, amen, to change the way that we were speaking, amen, because there were, we were so conditioned to saying negative things. I didn't realize how much I was working against myself, you know, by saying things that I didn't mean, amen, because there's some people that might think, ah, you know, I mean, you're, you're just taking this a little bit too far. Let me tell you something. The devil is a legalist. Amen. And he knows that if you can have what you say, he's going to do everything he can to get you to curse yourself. And so anytime we would catch our, one another saying things that we didn't believe, we would help each other. And I'm telling you right now, this is where it can get kind of interesting for you as couples, especially, or as brothers and sisters in Christ that are, that are learning and studying this revelation, embracing this master key. You know, if I said something like, man, my back is killing me, my wife would say, do you want me to agree with that confession? And I'd be like, no, 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 my back ain't killing me. You know, or if she would say something like, you know, man, these kids are driving me crazy. I'd be like, do you want me to pray and agree with you about that? And she'd be like, no, 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 I don't mean that. I take those words back. We'd say, we're putting spiritual roundup on these weeds that we're sowing. But we didn't realize how much we were speaking death and speaking against the very things that we were believing for. We were believing for God amen, to heal us, but we were over here confessing, amen, that the, the things that we were challenged with in our health were killing us, you know, 
or the very children that God blessed us with, amen, we're over here confessing that those children, amen, are not a blessing to us, amen? They're driving us crazy. So once you start gaining a revelation, again, once it goes from, okay, I, I know this, to where, bam, oh, the lights are on, to where it's rhema, it's alive. Once it gets to that place, I'm going to tell you right now, you are so accountable for what you know. You, you'll begin to be very skillful with the words that come out of your mouth. Amen. You'll be, you'll be more inclined to protect, amen, uh, the words that, that you speak because you understand these words are either going to help me or they're going to hurt me. These words are going to either bless somebody or they're going to curse somebody. Amen. We, the Bible says, are going to be held accountable for every idle word that comes out of our mouths. Think about that. To where God says every word that you speak Every idle word, that word idle simply means careless. Every careless word, whether you mention or not, God says, I'm gonna judge you for your speech, for what you say. So it's important, amen, that as we're receiving this revelation, amen, put spiritual roundup on all the negative things that you've been saying. Oh, I don't know what to do. Quit talking about the problem. Start confessing, I have the mind of Christ. I have the wisdom of God. God's given me understanding, amen. Quit confessing what's wrong. Quit talking about how much you don't know, how much you don't understand. Quit talking about how much you can't take it anymore. Those are the kind of things, amen, that are counterproductive to what it is that God wants to do in your life. Amen. You're going to have whatsoever you say, good or bad. So put a guard on your mouth. Amen. I tell people one of the best things that you can buy to help you with this revelation is a roll of duct tape. Because if you can't say the right things, keep your mouth shut until you can. Someone say amen, amen? <laughs> but I, I want us to continue right here, amen? I want you to look over here at Hebrews chapter 11, verse three with me. Hebrews 11, verse three. Oh, I love this. I love, I love the book of Hebrews, especially Hebrews chapter 11. It talks about right here, it says, through faith, come on, and we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, right? If you don't have no word, you don't have no faith because if the word of God is where faith comes from, then if you don't have the word, you don't have faith, amen? So he says right here, through faith or through the word of God, we understand that the worlds were framed, come on, God created everything, amen, by the words he spoke, through the world, though the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Amen? God says that, you know, he used his words, faith-filled words, amen, to, to build this beautiful world and universe. We're talking about the God that makes worlds out of words. It says he used his word to create everything. When you look over at Genesis chapter 1, Go through there and underline every time it, the, it, it, it mentions God said. Underline every time God said, God said, God said. Look at this real quick, just for the sake of giving you a good example. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says, In the beginning God created. So notice God's creating. Let's watch how he does it. The heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. That word void means chaotic. It doesn't mean it was a blank canvas. It means everything was out of place. And there's a reason for that, but eh, we're not going to get into that revelation today. It says the word was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now get this verse three. And God said, God said, let there be light. And guess what happened? Light was. All right. Now look at every time God said. It goes on verse six, and God said, let there be a firmament between, you know, the, the, the midst of the water, amen, that divides the waters from the waters. He says, you know, let there be land, and land was. Come on, let's continue down. Verse nine, and God said. Verse 11, God said. Verse 14, God said. Verse 20, God said. Verse 24, God said. Verse 26, God said. Verse 29, you know what it says, God said, amen. And then look at verse 31. And God, mm -mm -mm, he didn't say, the Bible says God saw. God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. Look at this. God saw everything he created. He saw what, what he spoke. His words manifested. Well, you're made in the image of God. 
Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Remember, God said, let us, amen, that word us is the, the Hebrew word uh, Elohim, which is the plural form of God, amen, which represents God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. They said, let us make man like us. Everything else that God made, he created. But when God made you and me, God made a copy. He said, let's not only make them look like us, he said, let's make them in our likeness to where basically God put his stuff inside of us. The power to speak life, the power to speak words, and those words take on manifestation. And we see that played out after God made man. The Bible says that the Lord put, he planted a garden and he put Adam in the garden. And he brought all of the animals to Adam to see what Adam would call them. And whatever Adam called them, that's what the animals are to this very day. Adam said, that's a chicken. And you know what? A chicken still called a chicken a day. Why? Because Adam said it. Not because God said it. Adam said it. A cow's a cow today. Why? Because Adam said it. And then when God made Eve, the Bible says that when he brought her to Adam, Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He says, she shall be called woman. He says, you know what? Because of this, a man will leave his father and his mother and he'll cleave to his wife. The two become one flesh. And to this day, we know that that powerful miracle of when two people get married, they blend and become one. That miracle takes place, not because God said it, but because God's creation, the little creator, man, spoke it, and it's still holding true to this day. This is before Adam and Eve fell into sin. So you need to understand, you are a little creator. In the same way, amen, we read over here in Hebrews chapter 11, again, verse 3, that through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Understand, God's going to use his word to build your world, your life, amen. He's going to use his word to make your life, amen, be what he intended for your life to be. Someone say amen, amen. It says people, amen, will live by, who, who live by faith. Check this out. People that live by faith, Amen. They're going to see what they say come to pass. Notice what it says right here in verse 2. It says, for by it, talking about faith, the elders obtained a good report. Let me tell you something. People that live by faith, people that live by the word of God, people that are skillful with this revelation I'm sharing with you, they always have a good report. Have you noticed that? People that live by the word always have a good report. They always have something positive that they want to share, something positive, a uh, you know testimony about what God not only has done, but what God is doing, you know? But it's amazing how people that don't have the word tend to be critical of those that do. You know, there's some people that don't like hearing, you know, when, you, when they share their problems with you and you say, well, what does the Bible say? What does the word of God say about that? Some people don't like that because again, they would rather say what they have instead of have, you know, you know what I'm saying? Say what they have instead of say what God says they have. So it's important for us to understand this, amen? This needs to become so real to us, amen? Through faith, the worlds were framed and formed. Let me give you one more scripture to go with this real quick. Look over here at Isaiah 51, verse 16. Isaiah 51, verse 16. Oh, I love this. I remember the first time I read this, man, it just made me shout. Look what God says right here. I have put my words in your mouth. Come on, where's God's words at? They gotta be in your mouth and in your heart. He says, and I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, thou art my people. Check this out. God says, I've put my word inside of your mouth. You know why? So that you can plant the heavens. So that the same way God spoke the word and created his, this world, God's saying, I'm putting my word in your mouth so that you can use my word to create your world as well. This is powerful revelation, amen. And I'm telling you, this works. I'm speaking to you as a man, amen, that has applied what I'm teaching you right now, and it works, amen, it works. And so as we move forward with this revelation, I wanna encourage you, get wisdom and get understanding concerning this. Wisdom is you having what is available revealed, and understanding gives you the ability to know how to apply wisdom, amen. If you will, turn with me real quick over to Proverbs chapter four, verse seven. I only know we got a little bit of time left, but I, I wanna leave you with something really good here. 
Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Thank you, Lord. It says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, because wisdom is the principal thing, it means this, this right here is the main thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. It says, therefore, get wisdom. And with all your getting, look at this, get understanding. So notice he says there's two things you need to get. Write these two things down. You need to get wisdom and you need to get understanding. Amen. He said, this is the principal thing. Amen. We need wisdom. Wisdom on what? Wisdom on how to apply the word of God, wisdom to, to say what God says, amen. Wisdom, amen, to, 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 to apply, amen, and to activate, amen, this, this creative force that has been instilled within our being. It's in our DNA, amen, to where we can have what we say, amen, just like God, just like God, amen. And he says right here, in all you're getting, get wisdom and get understanding, why? Look at this. Hold your place right there. Look at this. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. Look at this. Man, this is good stuff. Happy. Amen. How many of you want to be happy? He said, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that gets understanding. If you're depressed, you're upset, amen, you, 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 you don't feel right, I'm telling you right now, get some wisdom. Get some understanding. God says the person that has wisdom and understanding is a person whose, whose state of being is happy. Hey Amen. There's a lot of Christians that aren't happy right now. And I'll tell you what, if you're not happy and you're a believer, then you're doing something wrong. It's not God. It's not, the problem ain't on God's end. The problem has to be something that you're doing or not doing. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because the Bible tells us in the book of uh, Haggai, you know, that if it looks like things aren't working from the word, it says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Well, what does that mean? Your ways are simply your past and your present conduct. How you've been living and how you're living now. What you've been saying and what you're saying now. That is your ways, amen? And the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but it leads to death and destruction. Amen? Now, if there's a way that seems right, how many know there's a way that is right? And I'm telling you, the way that is right is God's word. So you need to get wisdom about God's word. You need to get understanding about how to apply God's word. So that way you can be happy when you receive the manifestation of God's word. Praise God, amen? That you can be happy. And that's my desire. I want you happy today. I want you blessed. I want you to be experiencing the, the joy of watching the word of God be manifested in your life, amen? Because that's what God wants. And I'm telling you, the words that you speak are so powerful. The Bible says that angels hearken under the voice of God's word. I mean, you get angels involved when you say what God says. It's no different than when Daniel had been fasting and praying for 21 days. And remember when the archangel showed up, man, what did he say? He said, man, the prince of Persia was resisting me, that spirit. And this is what he told Daniel. He said, I have come, not because God sent me, he said, but I have come for thy words, for thy words. Oh, I'm telling you, this is some huge stuff. Come on, and all you're getting, get what? Wisdom. And all you're getting, get what? Understanding. Let me give you another scripture here before we close. Look at Proverbs chapter four, one more time. Let's look at verse five, and we'll read through verse seven. Get wisdom, underline get. Get wisdom, get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline thy words of thy mouth, from thy mouth. He said, man, keep my word in your mouth. Check this out. Forsake her not, she shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get, underline that in your Bible, get wisdom. And what? And with all your getting, get understanding. Underline that word get. Notice he's saying you can get it, which means you can have it. If he's saying get wisdom, it means you can have wisdom. If he's saying get understanding, you can get understanding. He wouldn't say get it if it's not available to you and I, my brothers and sisters. So I'm telling you, go to the throne of God. Have some throne time. Amen. And I'm going to be honest with you. Go into the presence of God. Seek him and learn the vocabulary of silence. Learn how to approach God and be still. 
Amen. Go with a notebook, amen, and let God speak to you. Amen. I'm telling you, listen, because what he has to say is more important than what you have to say. God already knows what's in your heart. God already, he, he's all knowing. Amen. And I understand there's a place for us to pray. There's a place for us to make our petitions known. And there is a time to speak. But let me tell you something. There is a time for us to listen. And that's something I think that every one of us can work on is doing more time listening to hear what God says. That's part of the way that you get wisdom. Amen. It's how you also get understanding. Another way that you receive wisdom and understanding is doing what you're doing right now. Here you are at church. Amen. Here you are. Amen. As a scholar, a student of the word. Amen. Receiving revelation knowledge, revelation that's going to change your life and cause your dreams to become a reality. I believe that the chapter that God is writing in your life right now is going to be the finest chapter of your life. Because if you will allow wisdom and understanding of this truth, amen, to have a place inside of you, you're going to see the promises of God be possessed, amen, in your life. Someone say, praise the Lord, amen. So in all of you getting, get it because it's available, amen. Where do we start to get the principal thing? Where do we start to get wisdom? Where, where does that come from? You know, where's the source of it? Where, where should you begin to get wisdom and where should you begin to get understanding? Let me leave you with this final scripture. In Proverbs chapter 111, let's go there real quick. Proverbs 111, or Psalms 111. My bad, I was going, there ain't no Proverbs. <laughs> Psalms 111, <laughs> hallelujah. Oh, I love the word, amen, just getting ahead of myself here. Proverbs 111, and I want us to look at verse 10, amen. If you're there, shout amen. Look at this, Proverbs 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning, the beginning of wisdom and good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Again, what do we read over in Proverbs 4, 7? He said, wisdom is the principal thing. Well, what, where do you begin? He says that the fear of the Lord is where wisdom comes from. Well, what is the fear of the Lord? Write this down. This is the easiest definition I can give you of the fear of the Lord. It's not you being afraid of God. Don't misunderstand that. Some people have misunderstood that. The fear of the Lord is simply this. Love what God loves and hate what God hates. That is the fear of the Lord. That's where you want to start. God loves his word because God and his word are one. What God doesn't like, what God hates, is when we take this tool, this creative force, our mouth, when we use this to speak death. It's when we use this mouth to lie. It's when we use this mouth to destroy. It's when we use this mouth to create gossip and rumors. God hates that. Amen? God hates it. It's something that he despises. Amen? The Bible tells us, amen, that no liar will make it into heaven. I'm telling you, this is a powerful truth. So, Take what you've received today and, and let it have a place inside of you. Let me say a prayer over you as we dismiss tonight. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this audience. I thank you for all my brothers and sisters. I thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us things, Lord, that are going to enhance our walk with you. And I pray blessings over your people, Lord. Let this be the greatest week of their lives. I pray for manifestation, Lord, of the things that they've been believing for. And I pray, Lord, continue, Lord, to cause revelation, Lord, to flow, Lord, in them and through them right now, Lord. I pray, Lord, as this broadcast ends, mighty God, as this service ends, Lord, I know that what you're sharing will not. Lord, speak to your sons and your daughters. Lord, release the peace and, Lord, cause them, Lord, to experience the greatest joy and happiness. You said happy are the people whose God is their Lord. And I pray that over your people tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you again for being, amen, here with me tonight. I, I appreciate you. I love you. And uh, we look forward to being with you guys again. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. We love you.